Hello, welcome to this tutorial, the first in this series produced by FlingOS. I'm Edward Nutting, founder of the FlingOS project, and I'll be presenting this series. Feel free to message me via Twitter, at FlingOS or at EdNutting, via YouTube, or email me directly through flingos at outlook.com. So what will we be doing this series? Well, we'll be covering all the basics required for operating system development, including basic computer and processor architecture, assembly language, processor initialization, memory, interrupts, video output, and keyboards, compiling and linking both C and C sharp, our own basic operating system for PCs, and lastly, how to extend the OS using other Fling OS resources. I'll expect you to already be fairly well versed in C or C sharp, and have a reasonable understanding of general programming concepts, such as methods, loops, and variables. The main achievements by the end of this series will be a basic operating system, fundamental understanding of computers and operating systems, and knowledge of where to go next. So what is OS development? OS development is designing and programming an operating system for one or more architectures. Let me explain what some of that means. An operating system is made up of three key parts, the kernel, some drivers, and some user applications. In the most basic sense, the kernel is the program which executes when the computer is switched on, for the whole time the computer is switched on, and provides common functions for loading and running other programs. It also provides mechanisms for communication between running programs and management of those programs, since they have to run alongside each other. The kernel loads two types of programs, drivers and user applications. User applications are simple, they're just the day-to-day -day programs you or I would use, Notepad, Google Chrome, etc. Drivers are fairly simple too. Drivers are programs designed to control and manage particular pieces of hardware. For instance, keyboard drivers are programs for reading the data from a keyboard and converting that into characters which other programs can understand. For this reason, drivers are often called device drivers because they control one or more devices. These three parts, kernel, drivers, and user applications, make up an operating system such as Windows, Linux, or OS X. We'll look in more detail later at how these parts all fit together. I mentioned the word architecture earlier, so let's go back to that for a minute. An architecture is a specific processor design. There are various, more specific definitions than this, but for basic understanding, this will do. So when we talk about target architectures, what we really mean is which processors is our operating system designed to run on. In this series, we will be targeting any x86, 32, or 64-bit processor. x86 processors are in the vast majority of PCs and laptops around the world. If you're running Windows, you're almost certainly running x86, so you won't need to worry about this too much. If you're interested in writing an operating system for MIPS, Imagination Technologies Processor Architecture, FlingOS also has online tutorials for that in the form of articles. If you head over to the docs website, you'll find them there. Now that we have some idea what it is we're trying to create, we'll look at how operating system development is different from almost all other kinds of development. This will also give us a better understanding of the technical side of what operating system development involves. Probably the majority of developers nowadays are high-level developers. What this means is that they don't have to deal with the hardware. For the most part, they just have to import some libraries from a framework and call the relevant functions. At worst, they have to call down to the operating system directly to ask it to do something like read a file. Taking this idea of calling down and high-level versus low-level development a bit further, we can imagine high-level developers as being on top of a cliff, calling down to low-level developers at the bottom of the cliff. The developers at the top of the cliff get to enjoy the solidness of everything underneath them, i.e. the cliff itself. The developers at the bottom don't get such luxury, and have to deal directly with the wind and the waves of the hardware. The low-level developers manage the hardware so that the high-level developers can just shout down and ask for something and have it given to them. This analogy goes a step further in that the top of every cliff is pretty much the same, approximately flat land. But the views out and the sea beneath are all very different and require very different management. In this view, each different cliff is like a different processor architecture. 
To the high level developers on top of the cliff, they all seem pretty much the same. But to the low level developers at the bottom of the cliff, everything can be very different or very similar. It depends on the particular processor. Keep this in mind as a lot of the time we will be looking at just x86. On other architectures, the low level management can look very different, even if they fulfill the same high level task. So high level developers are at the top of the cliff writing their programs. But all programs have to execute on the hardware somehow. So we'll take a look at some familiar operations and how the hardware actually performs them. We won't use assembly code just yet, we'll keep things a little more abstract than that. But what we cover here will be important to understand for later in the series. Here's a very basic example, z equals x plus y, where x, y and z are integers of some kind. The language doesn't actually matter for this example, but here it is written in C and C-sharp just to help you out. As a human who understands maths, we find this very simple to understand. But what we have to do is break it down into atomic parts. That is, parts that can't be split up any further. These atomic parts are what a processor understands and can actually handle. Using our cliff analogy, we might imagine that to do this a high-level developer shouts down to the low-level developers, I want you to take the value of x, then I want you to take the value of y, add those together, then store that value in z. Each line is an atomic step. From our perspective, it can't be broken down any further. These atomic steps are called instructions. The things which instructions operate on are called data. In this example, the values of x, y, and z are data, and the operations are loading values, addition, and then storing a value. More often than not, operations have just one or two small pieces of data. By small, I mean 32 bits, i.e. 4 bytes in size. Small pieces of data, in this example the values of x, y, and z, are stored in what are called registers. A register is a small bit of memory directly built into the processor. Registers act as very fast temporary storage. In this example, the long-term values of x, y, and z would be stored in RAM, random access memory. RAM is persistent for as long as the computer is switched on. The values of x and y would be loaded from RAM into registers. The addition would be performed and the result would also go into a register. The result can then be copied from a register and stored in RAM, thus setting the value of z. Basic examples are all very well, but what happens when we want to do more complex operations? For example, how does a method call translate into individual instructions? Here's two examples. In the first example, we will call a method with no arguments and no return value. The second example is more complicated because we have parameters, but no return value. We will deal with return values later in the series when we look at x86 assembly language. Well, you should already know that when you call a method, the program changes location to the code for that method, then continues executing. For the inquisitive, there is an alternative approach, which is to copy the method's code into the next block of memory, and then just continue executing. This is very unusual, so I'd forget about it immediately. At a low level, this is called a jump. So in the first simple example, our guy at the top of the cliff just has to shout down, can you send me to the memory location for XYZ method? Cheers! The second example is more complicated. Now our guy on the top of the cliff must shout down, I want you to load the value of x, now load the value of y, now temporarily store those values, but not in registers because I want to use those later. Finally, move me to the memory location for method xyz. Cheers! How does the low-level developer handle the instruction temporarily store values, but not in registers? The answer is something called the stack. The stack is a normal first-in, last-out stack, and there is one per thread. It resides in RAM memory, so it can be as large or small as allocated by the system, and can normally store anything from one byte upwards in size. The stack is used to store values temporarily when a pre-allocated location is inappropriate. You might wonder why not just predetermine where in memory parameters go, but consider the effect of a function calling itself. 
So what happens in our more complex example when we call a method? Well, what happens is the low level guys load the values of X and Y and then push X and then Y onto the top of the stack. So if you were to pop the items, you would get Y then X. Later in the method, when the high level developer tries to use the parameters, the low level guys look up where they were on the stack and thus where they are in memory and so can load the values. Now I should say at this point that I have blurred the lines a bit between developer's code and execution. Some bits of what have previously been described actually happen during compilation. For example, the low level guys looking up where things are on the stack actually happens during compilation. But the addition operation is an actual operation which occurs during execution, i.e. at runtime. Finally on this topic, I will point out that a program is just a list of instructions and some preset data such as strings. Instructions just consist of an operation and often some data as well. Each line of high level code, be that C or C sharp or anything else, goes to one or more assembly level instructions, often three or four instructions. Execution of a program starts at the instruction corresponding to the start of the main method and then continues from there in order until the end of the program is reached. We've described an operating system as a program, and a program as a list of instructions executed in order. But if that's the case, how does the hardware know where it is in the program? This is solved by something called the instruction pointer. Note, in some architectures this is called the program counter. However, instruction pointer is, in my view, a much better way of thinking about it. The instruction pointer contains the address in memory of the next instruction which will execute. After an instruction executes, this is incremented to move to the next instruction. When a method is called, this register is directly changed to the address of the method to call. However, to return from a method this register must be directly updated to go back to where the method was called from. So how do we solve the problem of knowing where to go back to at the end of a method? This is actually quite simple. We treat the address of the caller as a parameter to all methods. So before we jump to the code for a method, we push the return address to the stack, then jump to the code. When we want to return from a method, we simply pop the return address from the stack and set the instruction pointer register to that value. So now we roughly understand how lines of code and methods translate into instructions, operations, data, and how those are stored in three places, registers, the stack, which we think of separately from memory, and general memory. Going back to our cliff analogy for the last time, therefore, let's imagine our high-level developers are like you. They don't just want to shout down to the low-level developers and wait for a response. They want to see what's going on. If they were to use binoculars and look over the edge of the cliff, what would they see? What they would see is three main things. The C, in our analogy, this is the hardware. It would consist of the processor, along with memory, possibly a graphics processor, and various other bits, which we will discuss in a minute. They would then see the device driver developers. Each of these people would be on the beach building their own sandcastle, in their own little patch using buckets of seawater from their designated area. They'd be ignoring each other and all other developers, even if those developers were doing something much better. If they needed extra sand or similar, they would ask the kernel developer. Essentially, each device driver is almost completely independent and knows nothing of the others. They can only get extra resources or information by asking the kernel developer. The kernel developer. This is the last part. This guy isn't building his own sandcastle. He's going around with buckets of sand, handing them out on request, and removing sand when it isn't used. He designates areas of the sea to particular device driver developers, and occasionally builds canals or walls between device driver sandcastles to link or protect them respectively. Essentially, the kernel is a manager and resource provider, helping to keep all the device drivers working. It also manages resource allocation and assigning bits of hardware to device drivers capable of managing that hardware. I said the hardware would consist of the processor, memory, and some other stuff. Let's first look at what's inside a processor, and then we'll look at what's attached to the processor. A processor has to perform the main operations very quickly, 
so all hardware that is essential to those operations is contained in the processor. This includes registers for temporary storage and processor configuration, the arithmetic logic unit for arithmetic and logical operations such as addition or exclusive OR, floating point unit for floating point calculations such as multiplication of floating point numbers, exception processing unit, EPU, for handling control flow of interrupts, memory management unit for managing access to the address bus. This last part brings us nicely onto memory. The address bus connects the CPU to RAM and things called I.O. ports. I.O. means input-output. RAM is addressed normally from 0 to 2 to the power 32 or 64 depending on the architecture. RAM is accessed using load and store instructions and also by giving the processor an address in a register and telling the processor to use the data at that address. This sort of data access is called memory indirect via a register. However, there are these other things called I.O. ports, which are also attached to the address bus. These allow you to send data to and receive data from attached devices. This is the oldest common way of communicating with devices. The simplest example is a serial port, where the data is written or read directly from the physical cable. I.O. ports are also addressed from 0 to 2 to the power of 32 or 64, again depending on the size of the architecture. Not all the addresses will relate to an actual device. Many addresses are fixed for certain devices, which we rely on as programmers when the computer first starts. There is one issue I haven't covered yet though. If memory and I.O. ports are both addressed from 0, they share the same addresses. So how does the address bus point to the correct one? The trick is the memory management unit accepts special in and out instructions for accessing I.O. ports, which tell it to switch from RAM access to I.O. port access. What I have described is roughly a single core processor. For our purposes, this is more than enough. You can research online how multi-core processors are put together and the difference between cores and processors. The processor, RAM and I.O. ports are attached to the motherboard but hopefully you realise there's a bit more to it than that. The motherboard also has connectors for hard disks, USB ports and more. Hard disks have their own special connectors. Nowadays that connector is called a SATA or Serial ATA connector. This is relatively recent however and many old laptops and PCs still have PATA connectors, which stands for Parallel ATA, or at least support for PATA over SATA. PATA used to just be called ATA, until the introduction of SATA when it was renamed. Also, PATA is used almost interchangeably with IDE. Strictly, a drive can be an IDE drive, but the connection is always PATA or SATA. CD drives are connected using the same physical cable, but use slightly different software protocols, so are called PATARP or SATARP devices. The PI stands for Packet Interface. The oldest form of PATA communicates via I.O. ports, I.O. ports are slow, but easy to use and set up, and do not require support for interrupts, so they are the easiest way to get devices working. You may also have heard of something called the PCI bus. The PCI bus, or Peripheral Component Interconnect, is an additional bus which uses I.O. ports to provide configuration and communication for a wide range of devices such as USB and graphics cards. PCI is just a bus a standard, and a bit of hardware for allocating ports for devices, discovering attached devices, and a standard way to configure those devices. Most devices then use their own communication methods. I'll briefly mention direct memory access, known as DMA. This is the alternate way of communicating with devices. It is much faster because you write data to memory and the device reads it directly from memory. This means much less data goes over the I.O. ports which are inherently slow. However, it is much more complicated to set up, especially in a basic operating system, as it requires proper support for interrupts. There is one final piece of hardware I haven't mentioned yet, which is often left out, but provides vital understanding for our task of creating an OS. This is the BIOS ROM. BIOS stands for Basic Input Output System. ROM stands for Read-Only Memory, 
though commonly these days the BIOS ROM is also writable. To explain what the BIOS is, we must think about what happens when we first switch on a computer. When the computer first powers on, the processor powers on. We already know that whenever the processor is on, it must have some code to run. So when the processor is first switched on, how does it know what code to run? The trick is, the processor is hardwired to load code from the BIOS ROM, which it executes. The BIOS code does various self-checks, and then proceeds to access things like the hard disk to load more code. We'll look in more detail next time at the BIOS and how a computer boots. For now, make sure you've absorbed what I've shown you this time, then move on when you think you're ready. You should know now what OS Dev is, what a processor is, including its main components, what an architecture is, the difference between high and low level development, a basic understanding of how lines of code translate into instructions, what a program is, how a processor keeps track of its location in a program, how programs keep track of temporary variables and temporary parameters, and basic devices that are attached to the processor and ways of communicating with them.